It's, uh, it's almost exactly two years since the cooperative launched its Young Driver Insurance uh, Telematics product on the, on the 15th of March 2011. Um, so today I thought I'd uh, share with you um, very, very briefly over the next 20 minutes or so eight, eight key lessons we've learnt uh, over our first two years. So uh, there, they, there they are, um, eight, eight key lessons which I'll, uh, which I'll work through over the next few minutes. So first of all, the, the early bird catches the worm. We had the advantage at the cooperative of being one of the first um, major brands to launch a telematics product back in, in 2011. Um, I say that's an advantage for, for several reasons, but primarily uh, a self-selection effect. So the early adopters in terms of customers who take up this product have undoubtedly been those who consider themselves uh, to be the safest drivers. Um, our loss ratios uh, reflect that performance and clearly that won't last forever as, as telematics becomes more mainstream um, but we've, we, we will obviously uh, ride that wave for as long as we can. I guess the question I'm most often asked uh, at, at seminars like this or indeed by, um, by, by government or, or by regulators is can telematics change behaviour or is it all down to um, self-selection effect of the, of the early adopters. Um, and that's, I find that quite a difficult question to answer. I, I firmly believe that telematics can change behaviour. Anecdotally, our customers tell us that it has changed their behaviour. Um, it's just very, very difficult to evidence it from the data at this stage because we had so few um, poor drivers in our portfolio to start with. So what we really want to see is a few poor drivers and how we can turn them into good drivers. Um, but all the, all, the, all the drivers who took up the product in the first place were, were, were good to start with, so it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to, to produce that evidence. Secondly, then, uh, second lesson from, from Little Acorns, Mighty Oaks Grow. So, Telematics at the moment probably has um, a bit over 200,000 live policies in the UK, I think, in, in, in personal lines, Telematics. I firmly believe that this will become uh, mass market over the next 10 years or so. And, and the reason I say that is that the data you get from a telematics box is so predictive of, of risk, so predictive of claims experience, that I can't imagine that the market will not adopt that as a, as a better predictor of risk. Every other example I can think of from an actuarial perspective of new rating factors coming along has been adopted uh, with great enthusiasm um, by, by, by those around the market who've had the opportunity to do so. So the only question for me is what the, what the speed of that growth will be and, and, and quite what it will look like. Um, I, I must admit to being slightly, uh, slightly surprised that gender, the gender directive hasn't had more of an impact so far than, than, it, than it has. We, we thought that that would be a big driver for, for increased take-up. Um, I'm not seeing that, that quite yet, although I think there's, there's still time uh, for that, uh, for young females to, to recognise that actually telematics is the way they can, they can still be priced. On their, um, on their safe driving behaviours. But I think what the mass market is waiting for is mass marketing. So at the moment, um, there's quite a lot of relatively small players, um, quite a lot of niche schemes, not much in the way of um, the really big players coming in with big marketing spend to promote telematics as a, as a solution. Um, you know, I think Confused have probably started that, that process um, but I think that's, that's what the big driver will be uh, to drive public awareness. I think on the way to mass market, there is still potential for additional niche segments. So um, at the moment, a cooperative is very much focused on, on young drivers. Um, other, other providers are focused on similar segments, perhaps inexperienced drivers. I think other niche segments are, are possible, um, particularly other high premium niche segments. So. There is certainly an opportunity, I think, um, for telematics perhaps in a, um, in a past convictions type market. So has the person with, with a couple of past convictions reformed their ways or, or, or are they still a bad risk? Perhaps in, um, in high risk geographical areas where, where there's a high premium, there's an opportunity uh, to use telematics as well. The, the big unknown here is, is, is the technology cost and that's why there's so much trialling going on at the moment of of, of smartphone apps of various descriptions, tethered and untethered, um, and why people are very interested in what will happen in the in the vehicle manufacturer space. Um, you know, so we've we've seen recently, for instance, uh, Citroen and UKI um, 
link up for um, devices fitted at, at, at points of manufacture, which obviously brings the cost down. So the market will progress. I have no doubt that um, it will become um, you know, much bigger than it currently is over, over the next 10 years or so. I, I, I can't quite predict at this stage what form that will take. Third lesson we've learned then is, is, is that fortune favours the brave. So this is, this is in some ways linked to the, the, uh, the early bird catches the worm one. I think so far I'm, I'm perhaps slightly disappointed if I, if I look at the market that um, products that have launched so far have all been quite similar. So there was the kind of first generation telematics products, if you like, which were largely based on, on mileage. Um, I like to think Cooperative was at the forefront of a, of a second wave of, of, of behavioural based products. Um, and we, when we launched, priced on, on, on four main factors, uh, on speed, on acceleration and braking, on cornering and on time of day. And largely most of the products that, that I've seen come out since have, have, have followed a very similar approach using those uh, four main factors. Um, and there's been a, perhaps evolution hasn't progressed as, as quickly as I thought it might with, with, with new factors coming into play. Um, I noticed that, um, um, was it Sheila's Wheels recently have introduced a, a, a road familiarity factor? Um, but I think there are further gains uh, still to be had and we'll wait and see what the, what the next big steps are. I think, the, you know, the reason I say fortune favours the brave, I think there are, there are big gains to be had um, for, the, for the providers who are, are prepared to take that next step and identify uh, those next um, most predictive factors coming out of the telematics data. And again, linked to that, I think information is king. And one of the reasons why we at the cooperative um, decided to, to launch a product early, apart from the fact that um, we thought there was a, a real uh, social need for a, a affordable young driver insurance, was that the early adopters um, have the opportunity to, to get a real wealth of data. Um, now, I think... We, we now have um, quite a lot of uh, telematics data, which we're still only really scratching the surface of in terms of how we use it. Um, I think there's, there's real potential there to look beyond those first four factors that we've identified. What, what other factors will we come up with? So um, talked about uh, talked about familiarity as coming on, on with, with Sheila's wheels. Um, things like congestion. What proportion of your time do you, do you drive in, in rush hour traffic um, as opposed to sort of free open roads? Um, road type is one that's, that's often been mentioned, but actually I've, I've not seen much use of yet in terms of how much of your driving is done on, on motorways versus, um, versus country roads versus built up areas. What's your, what's your average length of journey? Do you do, you do lots of kind of um, you know, four, hour length, four hour long motorway journeys where, um, where perhaps you, 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 you're quite tired and your attention's elapsed by, by the end of that journey? Or is it, is it all um, short, short trips? Um, you know, I can see potential perhaps for um, sort of geofence type products where, whereby um, you know, your, your premium goes up if you, if you enter certain uh, accident hotspot type, type areas. I think there's you know, a vast, vast array of, of information to come out of the data that we're still only really scratching the surface of. Um, and it does take time uh, to build up that data and to analyse that data. Um, you know, I see, uh, I see Tony Lovick sitting in the front row. I remember him telling me some of the analysis they did in the, in the original uh, Aviva pilot. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, does it make a difference whether you're, whether you're travelling into the, into the setting sun or, or away from it in the evening? Um, you know, I'm sure there's, there's uh, huge, huge amounts that can be learnt um, from, from this data. Fifth one then, many, many hands make light work. Telematics is very resource intensive. Um, in, in lots of different ways, really. So, you know, all that all that data that we collect, um, you know, needs needs people to analyse it. As I say, we're still really only uh, scratching the surface in that um, analysis. Um, you know, that that needs that needs people to, to do it. Going back right back to the uh, the installation process, installing the box, um, that that obviously takes with a with a professionally installed box a human being to go out. Uh, and, and fit that box the way, the way we operate our products at the moment. That's resource intensive, but we think it's very valuable um, in having an engineer go out, perhaps able to answer any, any, any questions the customer might have, to check their documents, to check the vehicle is the one they, they specified. 
uh, to check there's uh, no, no pre-existing damage on the vehicle and, and, and so on. Increasingly, we're getting lots of um, subject access requests under the Data Protection Act. That takes a whole industry of, um, of uh, um, accepting those requests, processing those requests, and, and sending, out, sending out data to, to the customers that they, they want for all sorts of different reasons, whether, whether that be um, you know, to, to, uh, to challenge um, the, the way we've priced their policy, whether it be um, uh, in, in relation to an accident, to look at the circumstances of an accident, um, in one case recently, we were, we were asked to prove that, that a vehicle wasn't um, where, the, where the traffic warden alleged it was when they, when they issued a parking ticket. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that sort of um, process going on. That, that all takes people. We've, um, as part of our policy conditions, we, we reserve the right to cancel policies uh, in, the, in the event of very extreme driving behaviour. So, um, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're caught... You know, if the box, uh, box finds that you're driving perhaps 70 miles an hour in a built-up area, then, then we think perhaps this isn't, this isn't the type of risk we want, and actually um, it's in society's best interest for us to um, uh, you know, send a message to that, that customer and, and, and cancel their policy. Um, because of the customer implications of, of cancelling policies, we do take that process very seriously, and we manually check um, all those cancellations before we issue them. That, again, is resource-intensive. Claims handling, you know, if you, if, you, if you really take this to, um, to, to its extreme, then looking at that telematics data um, in relation to a claim is quite resource intensive. So, uh, you know, I think our lesson from this is that trying to run telematics as a, as a sideline really doesn't work. And, and the people who will make this work and, and, and uh, you know, really take telematics to the next level will be those who um, have, have ring-fenced specialist resource looking at it. Sixth lesson, um, <coughs> the customer is, is, is always right. Um, customers have lots of different views of telematics. Um, and I suppose one of our lessons, uh, particularly being aimed as we are at a, at a, at a young driver segment, um, is just how low the level of awareness amongst customers of insurance in general is actually amongst, amongst new drivers, 17, 18 year olds, um, let alone anything to do with telematics. So, um, we really do have to sort of hold their hand through the process and explain some of the basics of, of what insurance is about, um, you know, as, as well as having to explain uh, the process of having a box fitted and what it monitors and all that kind of stuff. Customers do want to know how to improve their driving and therefore how to uh, reduce the price they pay for their insurance. And actually we want to, um, to educate them in that. Part of the reason we launched this product was to um, try and promote road safety and try to um, you know, encourage, encourage drivers how to, how to drive more safely. There's a balance to be struck though, we don't, whilst, whilst we want to um, inform customers on how to drive more safely and how to uh, reduce their premiums, we don't necessarily want to give away um, you know, all our hard won analysis and data in terms of how our pricing algorithm works. Um, we don't necessarily also want to tie ourselves into uh, always using the same factors in exactly the same way forevermore. Um, so there's a balance to be struck between how much information we give the customer to help them improve and, and, and you know, how much we sort of reserve the right to change that um, behind the scenes. So on our, on our dashboard, we, we show the customer those four main factors that I talked about, speed, acceleration, braking, cornering, and time of day, in terms of how, they, how, their, um, how their score is, is running currently, uh, and gives them tips on, on how they can improve that. You know, the, there are some potential rating factors which are, are very predictive, but there's not much a customer can actually do about them. So, you know, if a customer's uh, lifestyle is such that they, they will always drive in, in rush hour congested traffic, then, you know, that might be very interesting for us from a pricing point of view. Is there anything realistically the customer can, can, can do about it? If, you know, if, if, they were, if they were going to change their lifestyle to avoid rush hour, they'd probably have already done it without, without our influence. Um, so there's a balance between how much information we give the customer and, and how much we, we sort of keep to ourselves. Sort of in this space as well is, there's, is, is a, um, a conduct risk um, minefield. So um, the FSA and the, the, um, the conduct business risk unit, which will, which will become the, the FCA, um, are looking very hard at this, this space. Um, and the ABI has been doing some work on, on producing a, a sort of best practice guide. Um, 
as to how we might all address those, those conduct risk issues. Uh, because telematics does have some unique challenges in terms of how we explain to customers how we will use their data, in terms of how we <coughs> make clear to them what, what can happen to their, their premium if we vary it mid-term, um, depending on, on, on their driving behaviour, on what the cancellation process might look like if, if they do um, uh, <coughs> exceed the speed limit too often or, or too, in too extreme a way. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, potential, potential risks there in, in that sort of space that um, you know, we, we have to be very careful to, to make sure the customer's got all the right uh, information. And that means there's, there's, there's a wealth of documentation on, on a telematics product uh, at the point of sale that perhaps isn't, isn't there for a normal, a normal product. Um, but it is very important to think about these things from a, from a customer perspective. My seventh lesson then, um, horses for courses. So I think as we've, as we've progressed through this, we, Cooperative obviously launched a young driver um, specific product um, with, with professionally installed um, devices um, with the, the pricing factors that I've, that I've mentioned. I think as we've, as we've learned through this process, what I would say is that product is not necessarily the one we would launch if we were aiming at a different market segment. So um, I think the jury's still out, but um, you know, less expensive devices uh, smartphone app type things might be uh, might be more appropriate for lower risk segments. There's a trade-off there between uh, the robustness of the data and being being certain that the, the box is always switched on when the, when the vehicle's moving against against the cost. And that trade-off might be different for different uh, risk segments in the market. I think the pricing structures might be different for different um, different segments in the market. So for young drivers, we know that how often they drive very late at night is 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 a key factor. Um, you know, large proportion of young driver accidents and particularly serious accidents happen, happen late at night. Um, but for, for older drivers, is that really as material a factor? Um, or, or actually, is it, is it more about their, their, their daily commute? Now, I think, um, you know, admin systems, uh, you know, is, is perhaps an area where Horses for Courses comes in as well. So, you know, uh, we and, and I guess lots of other providers are, are, are trying to run telematics products on on systems that, that, that weren't really de designed for that and, and perhaps traditional um, sort of broker-based systems. And that causes a problem in an environment whereby you know, we know that we will probably make um, three midterm adjustments a year to make a quarterly premium adjustment. And if, if, you, if you're working on a system which, um, which treats midterm adjustments in a sort of traditional broker way and, and tries to compare um, <coughs> the, 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 price, the price now on a kind of new v new basis or, or whatever, that, that can cause some, some practical difficulties. <laughs> Um, and again, I think you know that there may be a need to, to invest in specialist telematic systems for, for players who want to want to really grow this market and take it very seriously. And my, my, my final lesson, I suppose, is, is is separate the wheat from the chaff. So, one of the um, one of the bullet points I was I was given to to talk to today was about renewals and how we might um, you know, promote renewal of, of telematics based products. And actually, I'd sort of turn that around. Renewal of telematics based products is very easy. Um, because these, these customers are, are self-selecting, because they're, they're good risks, um, you know, they know the cheapest premium they're likely to get is from a telematics product. They know they're taking credit for their, their good driving behaviour. Currently, there are, there are some barriers uh, to switching. I think questionable how long those will last. It's an area that the, that the FSA are looking at. But um, you know, for instance, um, you know, there, will, there, there is an implicit cost if they want to switch to another telematics product for, for, for a box to be installed because we don't um, share boxes around the industry. Um, to switch to a non-telematics product, it's, um, th that, that customer won't take with them the benefit of their, their safe driving history, um, whereas we will give them credit for that in their, in their renewal price. Couple that with, um, you know, regardless of telematics, the fact that our target market is young drivers um, as, they, as they gain experience, as they gain no claims discount levels, that the premium is typically fall anyway. So we see a, a fantastic um, renewal experience uh, from, from our customers. And also, I think that's helped by, by a greater level of engagement. So typically, if you think that um, you know, you know, an, an insurance customer might, might talk to you once a year at renewal if you're lucky, and, and, and probably then under sufferance, um, you know, we see uh, you know, high proportions of our customers logging onto their dashboards every week to see how they're driving, what score we're giving them, what, that, what will happen to their premium. The level of engagement with, with an insurer 
uh, is, is, is much greater than a traditional product and that we, we see that as a real opportunity um, to, to get that customer to buy into what we're trying to achieve. So the challenge isn't really about improving re retention rates, retention rates are, are fantastic. It's about making sure we're keeping the customers we want to keep um, in, in terms of, in terms of um, uh, giving them the right price, so rewarding those customers who are driving safely according to, according to the data we've collected over the, over the last year. Uh, but it's not all about price, I think it's about engagement as well and looking at how we engage uh, with those customers that we want to keep to, um, uh, to really make sure that they're the ones that stay with us. Um, those who've perhaps not been driving as safely, well either, either we need to uh, incentivise them to improve their driving or actually you know, we're quite happy to sort of wave goodbye and they can, um, they can go and have claims with, with another insurer. Um, so that's been a, a sort of fairly whistle-stop tour. I think, uh, I think my 20 minutes is, is, is just about up, but that's um, been a whistle-stop tour through, um, through, through eight key lessons that we've learned over our first two years in this business. Um, I think, uh, obviously, happy to take questions, I think, after, after Paul's session. Thank you.